This is the third part of my talk about diuresis rhinography. In part one, I gave an introduction and explained what PUJ, pelvic junction obstruction, was. Uh, in part two, I covered the principles, talked about kidney transit times and the effect of frusamide. Now, in part three, I'm going to discuss the practicalities of diuresis rhinography. I will describe the diuresis rhinography protocol and discuss how to interpret the results and show some examples. So let me describe the diuresis rhinography protocol. Uh, before any reengram, you need to make sure that the patient is adequately hydrated. Uh, I explained in a previous part of this talk that if the patient is dehydrated during a reengram, uh, you may well get a rising curve which looks like the kidney isn't emptying and could be mistaken uh, for obstruction when in fact the patient is just dehydrated. So we ask patients to eat and drink normally before a reengram. But it's also good practice uh, to ask them to drink additional uh, couple of glasses of water, 300 to 500 mils of water before the urinogram should make sure that they're adequately hydrated. In addition, because we're going to give a diuretic during the urinogram, uh, which uh, will flush out extra water from the body, uh, is a good idea to give them this water to replenish what they're going to lose during the urinogram. Then you can perform a standard urinogram using either Technetium 99M Mag 3 or Technetium 99M DTPA. Uh, they're both suitable for diuresis rhinography. Then when you start the renogram, if you find that the kidney does not empty spontaneously, you can give frusamide intravenously as long as that is clinically indicated for the patient. The standard dose for adults is half a milligram per kilogram body weight. Uh, we can give frusamide in one of three different ways. Uh, the conventional method is to give frusamide uh, 20 minutes into the renogram, and that's known as F plus 20. Uh, there uh, you wait to see if the renogram curve uh, is going up and doesn't come down spontaneously. By giving frusamide uh, after 20 minutes you can see its response, see whether it comes down or stays up after the frusamide. Another method uh, is to give frusamide at the start of the renogram. This is known as F0. Uh, that can be convenient in very small children because you only need to uh, put one butterfly needle into the, the child, get venous access once, you can inject some frusamide and then immediately follow that with the MAG3 or DTPA to start the, the renogram. Uh, that was the technique that Paddy O'Reilly originally used when he started investigating diuresis rhinography, but we now realise that it has some limitations uh, because you only get to see how the kidney performs at the high flow rate after the frusamide. You don't see how it would have performed without frusamide. The third method is frusamide 15 minutes before the renogram, known as F minus 15. So in this way, you give frusamide wait 15 minutes and then start the renogram. That gives an opportunity for maximum diuresis because you've had time for the diuretic effect to build up for 15 minutes before you start the renogram. So that puts the kidney under the greatest stress. Uh, the problem with that method is that you don't see whether the kidney might have drained spontaneously without frusamide because you only see um, the renogram with the high flow rate after frusamide. So the F plus 20 gives you the opportunity to see what the renogram is like before and after frusamide, but the other two techniques only give you the response after frusamide. Uh, whichever method you use, you should continue acquisition for 15 minutes after the frusamide in order to give time to see what the response is. So, for example, if you use F plus 20, you should continue the renogram for 35 minutes. Uh, in Manchester, the standard practice is to set up every renogram for 40 minutes so that we have adequate time to complete that. So the possible outcomes of a diuresis renogram are, uh, first of all, that the renogram might be completely normal, both with and without frusamide. So this indicates you've got a, a normal pelvis. It doesn't have a very large volume. Um, and Paddy originally called this type 1. What Paddy called type 2 was when you got an obstructed pattern, that is the renogram curve was continuously rising uh, and even after you gave frusamide it continued to, uh, to rise. So it uh, showed that this was a 
uh, obstructed pattern, it didn't wash out, this was a high pressure system. The opposite uh, was what Paddy called type 3A, where the renogram curve rises, but after you give frusamide, uh, shortly after that it whooshes down and um, empties very quickly. This indicates a uh, hypotonic system. It's a large volume, but it's low pressure, and Paddy called that type 3A. Then there is the type 3B, which is an equivocal response. Um, it continues uh, up like all the others until you give frusamide, but instead of either remaining obstructed or coming down, it comes way uh, between, so it comes down rather half-heartedly. So uh, it's important to distinguish this equivocal response here from the uh, really good response to frusamide, which comes down um, very rapidly. This sort of half-hearted response is considered to be equivocal. And uh, the other thing that can happen, which was uh, subsequently named type 4, uh, this was uh, discovered by uh, Homsey uh, and called Homsey's sign. So you give the frusamide partway through the renogram and it begins to come down, so you think it's going to be uh, not obstructed, but as the flow builds up it uh, begins to uh, obstruct and it goes up again. So this is a system that obstructs only at high flow. At low flow it was okay, but at high flow it uh, suddenly obstructs, and this is an intermittent um, type obstruction. This shows why you need to go on for 15 minutes after the frusamide, because this, uh, if you stop too soon after the frusamide, you wouldn't notice that it's going to go up again. There are always these equivocal cases, uh, where the uh, response, as I said, is a rather half-hearted one. It comes down uh, a little bit. Um, so if we have an equivocal case like that, one thing we can do is to repeat with frusamide given 15 minutes before the start. That gives time for the maximum diuresis to build up. So during this time the flow rate is going up and then when we start the renogram we either get a not obstructed system or we get an obstructed one. It reduces the occurrence of the half-hearted in-between uh, equivocal response. So this is a way of um, eliminating some of those equivocal responses with the F-15. Uh, so the F-15 is a way of clarifying uh, equivocal responses and that is something that uh, we would often use in Manchester after an equivocal result with F-20 we might move on to F-15 as a follow-up. But F-15 isn't the complete answer to everything. Some people think that uh, because F-15 uh, builds up to the maximum diuresis, it gives you the complete answer. But if you had a renogram like this, where we've given frusamide, waited 15 minutes, and then started the renogram, we got a curve like this, showing that it isn't emptying. Um, we want to know, is this patient always obstructed, in which case they need a pyloplasty to relieve that obstruction, because the high pressure, if left, will damage the kidney. But all we know is that it's obstructed at high flow rate, or, so we don't know what happens at normal flow rate. So maybe this is a problem only if the patient has high flow. So maybe if they've been out on the town and had a lot of beers, um, they um, produce a lot of uh, urine during that time, um, and they get an obstructed system like this. But we don't know what it's like at normal flow rate. So maybe rather than just needing a pyloplasty, maybe all they need to do is to lay off the beers um, and avoid this high flow situation. And the only way to distinguish them is to do a standard renogram without frusamide. So the F-15 on its own isn't the answer to everything. You often need a standard renogram as well. So here's some examples. Here's a system where we can see that the uh, left kidney continued to go up until frusamide was given and then it came down very rapidly after that. You can see that the response starts uh, very rapidly, three minutes after the uh, frusamide, the left kidney begins to, to come down. Uh, you can see another uh, thing on here that we continue the renogram to 40 minutes. As I said, uh, in Manchester, that's the standard to carry on to that. And because the patients had frusamide, they're very likely to have a full bladder and be wanting to rush to the, the toilet. Um, you could just stop the renogram at that point, but uh, it's nice practice to 
uh, continue the renogram but let the patient go to the toilet. So what happened here was that the patient got off the camera for about five minutes while they went to the toilet and then they came back again and we positioned them back in the same position and the gamma camera carried on acquiring. So effectively we have a curve that would have been like that had they been here all the time. So you can see that even though they weren't there all the time we can see what the renogram would have been and of course from the green curve here we can see that the bladder emptied um, and then uh, continue again. So this uh, uh, option of not stopping the acquisition just continuing even though the patient wasn't on the gamma camera allows you to easily continue uh, uh, for as long as you need after frizomide is given. Here's an example which is clearly obstructed. The um, left kidney uh, didn't respond at all to frusamide. It continued on its merry way going up and up and up. So that clearly shows that we have an obstructed system in the left kidney. Uh, you might also say the right kidney is obstructed because that doesn't respond to frusamide at all. Uh, but uh, remember I said in the previous part that uh, the frusamide to get to the site of action has to be secreted into the renal tubules. So in this case we've got a poorly functioning right kidney. So we can't really say that the frusamide uh, was able to produce enough diuresis to produce an effect in that kidney. So we have to be cautious and say we can't really say about the right kidney because its function is too poor. Um, the frusamide has probably not had enough uh, an effect and there probably wasn't much activity there to wash out anyway. Here's another uh, example of a patient who started with um, a renogram with frusamide at 15 minutes. Here you can see that the uh, response to frusamide three minutes after it started to come down, um, we let the patient go to the toilet and you can see that it would carry on going even if after they'd gone to the toilet. But this was not the classic uh, response that comes down whoosh really rapidly like that. It's a rather half-hearted one and that we would class as being an equivocal um, response. So following uh, an equivocal response uh, like that the practice would be to repeat with F-15 to uh, see what happens. So here was the F-15 renogram on this patient and you can see they had frusamide and when we started the renogram it was now an obstructed system, it's not emptying at all. So we can see that that uh, equivocal response had become an obstructive pattern uh, by the time we did F-15 and that shows the value of following up those equivocal responses with F-15. But as I said before, if the F-15 is the only thing you do, you miss out on knowing uh, what it's like at normal flow rate to know whether it might be alright at normal flow rate. Here's an example of a, a patient with Homs's sign. This happens to be a child so we gave the frusamide at time zero right at the beginning of the arenogram here and you can see in the right kidney it started off normally and began to come down but as the flow rate built up at this point here it got to the point where the uh, PUJ blocked off and so no urine was coming out of the right kidney and so it continued to rise again and it went up and up and up like that. Um, this was a, a, a child so you can see actually um, they were uh, the nappy uh, they were bladder was filling and then they were voiding into the nappy which is why the bladder curve goes up and down uh, like that. Um, here's a case study of a patient who had a solitary right kidney and was uh, known to have deteriorating renal function and because they've only got one functioning kidney it's important obviously to uh, protect that one so we needed to know whether they needed a, a, a pyeloplasty. So here is the renogram in January 2008 um, for the solitary right kidney. They were, had frusamide at this point but it didn't really uh, come down very much at all. That was um, an equivocal um, response. So we repeated uh, the next month with F-15 and you can see um, it doesn't empty at all. So clearly that's uh, an obstructed uh, kidney. So the patient went on to have um, a pyeloplasty. Um, uh, the, after the pyeloplasty operation they had a stent to uh, help the drainage and that was removed in June 2008. And then in August they came for a follow-up um, renogram. So here was the, uh, the renogram. Uh, remember before the operation it had not come down but here after frusamide it comes down nicely and so it does empty so it shows that the pyeloplasty was um, successful. Because of the 
only being a solitary kidney, this patient was followed up to make sure that um, it did maintain their function. So here, we, <coughs> here was the renogram a year later in uh, 2009. Because we know what this patient does at normal flow, we have seen the um, F plus 15 renogram. We could happily do an F minus 15 with this patient now because we don't need to repeat the um, uh, renogram uh, with normal flow rate, we know what it does at normal flow rate, and you can see that the F minus 15 is okay, it empties normally, and it was followed up the, the subsequent year and the year after that, showing that the function is maintained, um, and the patient kept being followed up with renograms each year to make sure that everything was okay. Now, as I said in the previous part of this talk, the alternative to doing diuresis renography is to measure parenchymal transit time by deconvolution renography. If you're going to do that, you need to give more activity. Um, if you're using MAG3, and at least 100 megabacrols of MAG3 is necessary for deconvolution, whereas for ordinary diuresis renography, in Manchester our standard is 50 megabacrols of MAG3 for an adult. Uh, this is um, more important for deconvolution to get enough counts, to get good statistics, to get a, a curve that's not noisy. Uh, you need to draw a region of interest over the heart, representing the blood input into the kidney. Uh, one over the whole kidney to represent uh, the activity in the whole kidney, including the renal pelvis. And then one for the parenchyma only, which has got to exclude the calyces and the pelvis. So that has to be a little rim around the outside edge of the kidney. Then you apply deconvolution using a technique that I've described in a, a second another talk uh, about uh, deconvolution of the renogram and you calculate two transit times the whole kidney mean transit time that is for a uh, radiopharmaceutical to pass through the whole of the kidney and the parenchymal mean transit time for the radiopharmaceutical to just pass through the renal parenchyma and then uh, one point to note is if you want to use this method is make sure that you are calculating, if you're calculating relative function, only do it for the whole kidney region. You can't use the parenchymal region for relative function, but it only contains part of the activity. So you've always got to draw the whole kidney region as well. Now, to interpret these transit times after deconvolution, if the whole kidney transit time is increased, that simply implies you've got a dilated renal pelvis, a large volume pelvis, but it doesn't say whether it's high or low pressure. And that's what is sometimes called an obstructive uropathy. If the parenchymal transit time is increased, that implies a reduced flow in the renal tubules. So that implies a high pressure uh, system, and that is a, what is sometimes called an obstructive nephropathy. And that's the high pressure system, the patient that needs the pyloplasty. So that's the end of the third part of this talk. Uh, in the next part, I'll go on to discuss the use of diuresis renography compared with deconvolution analysis uh, to calculate mean transit time and as compare the two techniques.